This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And then we're on. And today's guest, we've got a very interesting guest, I may add. We've got a very interesting podcast. We have Kev, everybody knows Kev's stories, convicted of murder, always pleaded his innocence. He's everywhere, TV shows now, books. The man's everywhere, aren't you, Kev? I am, yeah. There's a lot more coming up as well. Yeah, and you've got a live audience, which we'll plug straight away, Kev. When is this? It's the 23rd of February at Cambridge Country Club in Bourne with Peter Fury, Matt Legg, and uh, Kenny Collins, Hatton Garden Heist. And where can people Burglar. get tickets? You get them online. Uh, you're on my Instagram, TikTok, uh, and anybody I've just mentioned on their platforms as well. Yeah. Please. So, yeah, I'll leave the link in the description to go and see Ken, uh, Kev live where you can get a meet and greet photo, get to meet Big Peter Fury as well, who's an absolute legend. But like I say, today is a very interesting one. It's the first I've ever done. We've got someone who was kidnapped took for apparently stealing a hundred grand kev you were the man behind that and um, but now he's a sitting face to face and um, very interesting how are you feeling well uh nervous are you a bit anxious yeah yeah but um looking forward to it how are you feeling kev um i'm i'm really looking forward to this change because i feel it's it's going to benefit will better and i think it'll benefit a lot of people outside of here in terms of maybe what they've done to people. And when you meet someone, I, I had no idea what I'd done to Will's life until I met him. And the transformation as a result of hearing what I'd done to him in terms of how it affected his life, it's been massive to me. And I think there should be more along that line for rehabilitation and uh, making people think about their, what they've done and what they may do in the future. Their actions. Their actions, yeah. Like I say, well, fair play for something I got across the man like Kev's no stranger. He's very well known in the underworld. Very dangerous, not just outside the boxing ring, but inside it as well. I know he can scrap, like he's not a man to be fucked with, if we're, but if we're all honest here, he uh, you knows some dangerous people, very dangerous and capable himself, I know. Like, but his story's out there. And uh, uh, let's get a bit of backstory about you, though. What was your kind of back life like? Uh, well, I grew up in uh, Northamptonshire. County of Northamptonshire, um, sort of like council estate boy. Uh, went to secondary school, you know, national health glasses, freckles, ginger hair, bullied for all my school career. So I didn't really concentrate too much on school. Uh, my, I, I wanted to escape that. So that's hence me leaving my hometown to better my life, mm -hmm. uh, to move on with uh, basically get away from all the bullies where I'd go somewhere where I wouldn't know anybody. So I settled into a job uh, just outside London in Reading and uh, sort of started from there really with uh, working with the employment service for a number of years and then uh, got a job with, uh, applied for another job to better myself financially and sort of like climb that career ladder. I thought I was uh, taking on a, a nice new role with a distribution company, which as we all know, uh, didn't go to plan, where uh, 
things went adrift, yeah. took the wrong path, basically. I ended up uh, being taken by uh, Mr. Lane here and uh, for something that I didn't do. I believe uh, it was something that I didn't do. I can hand on heart say I had no involvement with that. Uh, as it's been proven, the police proved it after questioning under the duress as well. Mm -hmm. So if somebody stole money in my eyes and somebody takes them away to try and get their money back, for me, it's sort of justified. But if you're innocent, 100 grand worth of stuff went missing, you never done it, and then you get kidnapped, pressure put on you, and that's a different ball game from someone who's been bullied their whole life to then basically being bullied again where it's a life or death situation. What was the run up to it, Kev? How did this all come about? <clears throat> As Will uh, explained, there was £100,000 worth of equipment stolen. Um, the, the young lady that had reported it to her director, um, well, first of all, it was reported by a young girl in the firm. They went to the police. There was enough evidence to um, find the people. And Will will tell you how they came about it. They was filling the, 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 there was boxes and they were filling the boxes up with what was they filling the box up with? Bricks, woods. Bricks to replace the, the there was a thousand pound Kirby's, that's what they were. They stole uh, over a hundred thousand pounds worth, like we say. So um, the police didn't have enough evidence and the, the lads then went to the offices where the girl worked and they locked the doors and they were shaking the doors to get in. It wasn't Will, of course, but it was a load of lads that was part of a football firm in Reading. Um, and then I got a phone call asking me if I could come and speak to these lads. Did you, were you asked any questions beforehand from the police? No, no, I was totally clueless. I didn't know, have a clue what was going on. Uh, all I was, uh, on the night of the incident, I was, uh, my girlfriend at the time had to go to the office for some strange reason to pick up something, which I didn't think nothing of it because I just sat in the car, minding me, I think I was rolling a cigarette at the time when the door opened which i thought was just the office lads messing around because when he worked for kirby it was a bit of a mm -hmm. you know like to motivate the salesman you would have singing and dancing and joking with each other that's, that's what i thought it was but it wasn't yeah what information then did you have that it was will who was who stole the shipment uh, this is where it gets uh interesting so will was brought to the offices for me to take uh and before that, I was in these offices and was, everyone was in there telling them all that to, they didn't know what was going down, of course, the people who worked in the offices, only the mansion director did. So I've kept them all in the offices and they said, he's here, he's here. And, and you know what, it's hard to making them all poxy tea and stuff like that, looking after them. So then a fella came in, it was meant to be reported to be Will. So I've gone out to meet him. I just coming upstairs, I've clouted him, knocked him out. Ron Geezer. Talk about get two Ron Geezers in one night. So I brought him to, took him upstairs. I said, I know you feel, I said, listen, you can have a crack back at me. I said, nothing's going to happen to you. He's looking at me thinking I must be nuts. I said, I swear to you, you can hit me back and nothing's going to happen to you. And he didn't. So, and then Will turned up and um, I went out to the car, removed him from the car, opened the door, um, struck him several times with an iron bar, arms, head, Things like that. Because at the time, uh, what you haven't told you is that the, the young lady that had reported the thefts to the managing director was subsequently then threatened and she was pregnant. And I only found this out after I did restorative justice with Will. And Will then told me, no, she would, didn't have a baby. She was pregnant. I was told that a knife had been put to the girl and a knife had been put to the baby. And the bloke said, I'll cut you and I'll cut your baby. What's it come, it's transpired out now is that a knife was put to the lady and the lady's belly. And they said, I'll cut you and I'll cut your baby. So if I'd have known that, I think would have done a lot more to Will than I did. But what I did to him was, was enough anyway. It was terrible. So um, then I went and kidnapped him. But um, Will, obviously, uh, he is, he was a bit, it didn't look the way he looked now, to be fair. So you can imagine I was young myself, he was young. Um, but I took him away and um, I took him to some woods, uh, rural area, laid him down in front of the car, 
run over him a couple of times. And I did it again just to make sure he was giving me the right information of where people lived. He had no choice with even the cars on his legs, he's screaming. Um, and he knew he was in trouble because it was beating him all the time with an iron bar. But I just kept having the picture of the woman and the baby in my head. That is what I had in my head. Thinking, you've done this to a fucking woman, you're going to get it. So he gave us some phone numbers to check, so I had his family's details in Scotland. Um, which is why I kept putting the car over his legs as well to check that was correct. Put him back in the car, drove him to London, a place called uh, uh, Hogback Hill, in um, Perryvale. And there's a bridge there, with people who know, know the area. Stop the car. There's a canal. I took him down to the canal. He was walking, obviously, but I was helping him. Uh, smashed him over the head. Sprayed him with CS gas and pushed him in. Went back, got in the car. He had by then been reported missing. He was taken. He hadn't been seen. He was in hospital for a number of days. Didn't know his name or anything because of a concussion and such. And the hospital found a phone number in his trousers and phoned that number. And then they come about and said, yeah, look, Will's missing. He reported missing in Berkshire, Reading. And that's how come it came about. But what I would like to say, first of all, I apologise to Will. I've apologised to him previously anyway, and he knows heartfelt that I mean that. Uh, I got the wrong fella, but I got the right fella as far as I was concerned. And I brought shame on myself on a few podcasts I've done about this, and I'm saying I kidnapped the wrong fella, I kidnapped the wrong fella, without telling them the real facts. But uh, I hope people understand now why, I was just trying to make Will feel better. But when he was, the police arrested him, or took him in for questioning after this, after being of what was done to him, they were proper giving it to him. So like we'd get worse than what he's done to you and all the rest of it. You've done this, you've done that. Proper give it to him. Had him in the cells and everything. So then I got arrested and I was, what is funny about this and I'll laugh about it is my best friend, Marcus Lemaire. The old Bill said, if Lane's there, Lemaire's there, nick him. <laughs> So he got Nick and spent four months on my mind. I'm laughing about it now because he goes nuts about it. <laughs> I said, well, you're my best mate, ain't you? <laughs> you couldn't let me go in here on my own, could you? <laughs> so uh, he laughs about it now, but yeah, and then uh, we had a trial and that. The police got caught out lying in that as well. I don't want to divert from what, detect from what will happen, but the witnesses were met at the end of the road. Well, one witness was just found up by the police to do with the IDs. Because uh, I wasn't picked out on an ID parade. And then I went on an ID parade uh, and the police met this girl at the end of the road and said, we wanted to make a new statement. They phoned her up at home and asked her to meet her at the end of the road. And when she got in the back of the car, there's my file and pictures of me. So she said, yes, it looks like him, but it's not him. When it came to court, the statement said, yes, it looks like him, it's him. She said, I never said that. So the chief inspector had changed the statements. I got immediate bail, and subsequently I was on bail for some time. Then we went to court, uh, but two trials, hung jury, couldn't get a trial, and then a second trial. The jury was in Oxford Crown Court, and the jury was during the heat wave, and in 91, wasn't it? Uh, 91? 92. 92, uh, there we go. Um, I remember the heat wave then at the time, um, and the jury was being told of going into a hotel room. They went out and came back in no time at all with a guilty. I went downstairs to confer with my barrister, um, John Williams. We was called back upstairs. The jury came back in with a question for the judge, or a note for the judge, should I say. And they told the judge that they made a wrong decision. And the judge said, well, I've got to take your first answer on this. I said, I ain't a game show, you honor. And he said, I understand there's going to, I did say that. And he said, I understand there's going to be immediate appeal and a bail application. And I told my barrister not to appeal. I said, don't appeal. I said, and uh, don't ask for bail. I said, I did it, and I just faced the consequences. And the judge went two years, two years, two years, and two years, which I thought was about right, eight to 12 years I was told I was going to get. And he gave me two years to run concurrently. And he said, Mr. Lane, he said, you've acted as a vigilante. He said, but we can't have that in this country. And the jury, obviously, with the, he said, uh, and I said, okay, well, thank you very much. And he said, only gave me the two years to run concurrently. I said, thank you very much, Your Honor. Went downstairs and got on with my bird. How does it feel, Will, when you hear 
kind of that nightmare playing over just when it's you're hearing someone repeat it the man who's done it how does it make you feel no i accept it but previously it was hard you know like, to talk about it because uh, there's a lot of, a lot of people will be watching this thinking this this explains a lot now to my attitude basically like i've got a short a bit of a short temper and when i lose it i lose it but answering your question um i haven't really spoken about it to many many people um in the past up until about well since 2015 when it when it's when the ball started rolling again for me so basically i had a bit of a low period where it had not gone away i was still having the nightmares and the dreams but come 2015 i was sat watching a Palmarama program and well no sorry i was flicking through the channels and all of a sudden kevin's face popped up but the face i remember from the 90s the young face and then the face I'm not that young now. They should have gone through my car. Sorry, man. <laughs> he's still young looking. <laughs> um, but um, no, it's one of those things where I've kept up until 2015. I've kept privately. You know, I mean, no one knows other than a handful of people of what I went through. That my family don't understand, you know, I mean, what I actually went through because uh, I disassociated myself with them um, after the incident because I thought in my head, it, he's out there, he's got friends and he's still going to get me because he went to prison and he's, they're still wanting the money. This was all going through my head and, you know, it, I couldn't talk about it. But when I was at work, I had so much um, work to do. It was a distraction. and But... When I was coming home at night and going back to my digs or hotel, wherever I was staying, that's when the I would hang up the work face and the the victim face would come back basically, and I would just sort of sit thinking all all the time, why, why me, why me, what did I do? Why did people think I stole this money? Why did people do this? Why did he do what he did to me? You know. What age are you? Will? Uh, fifty six. Why was it you? Did someone point a finger at you to try and? Uh, take it away from myself but why would you the scapegoat well i i can't i can answer part of that question but i can't answer it fully but from what i gather is people it, the way i dressed the what i was wearing at the time because like at the time it was not there was no money around at the time everybody was out making making money but i was gone charity shops and buying like uh, like a, a, a civil uh like a a, a designer shirt for about a fiver and telling people I'd bought it cost fifty quid in the shop, you know what I mean. So a bit of a bit of bull, and people think, well, hold on, he's always got money, you know what I mean. But I, I just looked after my money at the time. I got paid. I looked after it. A lot of people used to blow their money the same day as they got paid. Me, I used to sort of string it out throughout the month. And when it got to that month, people would think, well, where's he getting the money from? Mm -hmm. But it's just something, you know, and I'd done. And I, I do can, it to this yeah, day. I can see this strain in your face. Was were you always like that, or was it this incident that's kind of brought all that on? No, no, it was since the incident. Yeah, I've been funny with money. I don't, I don't have money. I, I can't, I don't really save anything because I don't want people to turn around. You stole that, you nicked that. I stolen money. You know what I mean? So, I, so if I get money, I spend it. You know, I and mean? I don't have savings because I don't want anybody to turn around and say mm -hmm. where you got your money from. How does it make you feel, Kevin? You kind of hear the story and the damage it's done from all those years ago to now he's still struggling. You can see the struggle now. I still. think about it all the time. I told today, I'm hoping to come into some money soon, decent bit of money, uh, it'll be taken care of. And I feel like I owe that to him at least. But I ruined his life. He was homeless. He lived on the street. I absolutely ruined his life. You know? And to meet him and hear that, you know, I, I, look, I'm not a bad person. I've just done some bad things to fucking people who deserved it. He never. So that makes me feel terrible. Um, he he drink and drugs he's been on alcoholic all down to me while I'm getting in the front car with someone if he gets <laughs> in a car and, he, and then they take a wrong turn in as soon as they pull over he's out the back out the door won't sit in the front is it the front you won't sit in isn't it Will the front yeah won't sit in the front with people because that's why I took him from the front seat uh, it took him years to get over that um, and a lot more that we will tell you about to, but to hear what you've done to someone through your actions when they're sitting in front of you now, if you're an absolute heartless bastard, then it won't have an effect on you. But I'm not. And I've got to tell you, I think about it all the time. 
I talk to Will, we communicate, we have a laugh. He goes to work and, as you know, I was on the banged up programme and on his meetings and that, he says, anyone a fag? And goes to pull out a parcel out of his ass. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit flippant, I say that, but as you know what I did on banged up with Johnny Mercer, the MP. But for Will, what I did in the past, I'm hoping now I can change his life for the better. Get rid of that rucksack that he's carrying about on his back and park it up. And he does seem to be changing. He's, uh, he's telling me about some positives in his life now that weren't there before we met. But getting back to how it makes me feel, I believe that this is a way forward for anybody who's committed an act of, like this or many other acts for them to realise the impact that has on that person, how it impacted them for many years to come, um, it makes me feel ashamed. Yeah, I tell you what, though, well, man, it takes a brave man to sit across the man who's basically destroyed your life and try and get some closure on it. Like, it's unbelievable. And I've never seen many of these interviews. In fact, I've never seen an interview where a, the kidnapper s sits across from the victim and they're just having a discussion and hopefully other people can learn from it and understand Kev and understand the destruction that that life causes, especially if it's an innocent man. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't care if it was somebody who, if it was warranted and they deserved it, but it's the fact of the addiction comes, you're still paranoid, you're still get scared and it just, just destroyed your life totally. What's your recollection, recollection of that day? Of the incident? Yeah. <laughs> As if it was yesterday, basically. It, it, it's something that's in tattooed and embedded in my head all the time um going back to what kevin was saying that after the incident after the court case after kevin had got banged up and got his sentence uh, it was a case of bye-bye from the police and that was it i was left on my own basically no support no sort of like victim support no anything to help not me. even a lift home from the court not even a lift home i had to get a train home that day they brought me to the court but they didn't take me home <laughs> they took him to the court because he wasn't going to go he was at Armin and Iron about to turn it up and they come and took him. That's correct. You were missing on the first one, didn't you? Yeah, I went where well, basically the, the trial was supposed to be in Red and Crown Court on Tylehurst Road. Um, the police had sent two detectives around to pick me up to take me to court, but I had to, gone for a walk four o'clock in the morning. I was just walking and walking and uh, drinking and doing drugs and doing stupid things because I didn't want to go. I just didn't want to go. But I, the, stup the police actually phoned me a couple of hours later saying that your cost us a fortune. You've had to suspend the trial. We've had to sort of relocate now and we'll be picking you up, making sure you're not drinking. I said, no, you can't do that. So the second day of the trial was at Oxford Crown Court. Um, me and my mates, I got there a bit early. I had the taste. I wanted a drink. And that drink turned into a full-blown session before 10 o'clock. And I was absolutely steaming in the police in courts refused to let me stand that day. So the police took me home that night, uh, made sure I didn't drink, do drugs. Well, I did do drugs. I didn't, I didn't let them stop me do that. Um, so I did the drugs and um, they took me to court the next morning. I give my evidence. Uh, basically, that was it. See you later. I said, oh, I'm going to come back tomorrow. No, we don't want you to uh, come back and listen to anything that's going on. So I was uh, told not to, you know, become a, like, a, what do you call it? A risk? Uh, no, a, a spectator, basically. Mm. And again, a, a, it could be risk that someone could be potentially waiting for you to take you outside of the court. Mm -hmm. Was that not a concern, though? Because you know how dangerous Kev was it, and what you put you through to then be sitting on a dock? Well, it was, but at the end of the day, uh, when I left that court, he was locked up and I was free. And I knew, I, I was, I was, I got so paranoid where like, I would, stop well if i was walking down the road i would stop dead in the street and actually walk back the way i'd come just to see if anybody was following me because i heard of his tactics like bushes following in your car watching you you know like sending other people to follow you so i was off for 30 years that went through my head is he following me is he there? but no he's in jail you know was, was that not a concern when you you gave evidence were you ever worried because you know how oh yeah what was a comeback were you ever thinking about just fucking off yeah, well, the police promised me a lot of things which they didn't didn't fulfil. They uh, said that we'll make sure you looked after after the case. There was none of that. What it did was, they promise? They just said that we'll try and get you relocated somewhere if you wanted anywhere in the country, if you wanted to move out the area, a bit of relocation, not the proper uh, 
sort of like name name changer, but they would sort of like help me mm -hmm. and go to an area and then put some kind of flag on me if there was an in incident. The first person they would go to be would be Kevin, basically. So like, yeah. he's been injured again. Why is he injured? What do you know about it? So that's where they would start mm -hmm. their chain of command. So even Will gave evidence. Kev, were you thinking of finishing the job? I had people at court. I'll say it now. And um, they were there for a reason. Like he said, some people in the court I had, as well as outside. For the right reasons. Um, I never thought about finishing it, no. I've done my time. I thought, oh, listen, I'm happy with the crime. I've done it. So I never, not once, did I think about going to, going back and finding him at all. Uh, no, not at all. But what's important here is that what the police actually did to him when they had him in the police station. I know I'm not diverting the, the, the injustice of what's already happened to him by myself, but he should have been taken care of a lot more in terms of psychologically the beatings he got. He used to go shopping at four o'clock in the morning at, no, at night rather than going to daytime because there's more people. What I've done to him is appalling how it's affected his life. So I'm glad that um, I did think about going back and getting uh, some of the other football, the blokes that had done it with him. But again, then I served and said, come home, I've got them in my life. Um, but it's always in the back of your brain, isn't it? Uh, I'm not thinking about going to get him now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> See, when you get kidnapped, well, were you thinking you were going to die? Yeah. I thought that was it. Because it's weird, like, when I've had my therapy and the therapist asked me that same question, and, and not, not just you, but a lot of people have asked me, but what was going through your head? As a other in the white lights that I was getting with the beatings, I was having little flashbacks to like childhood, you know, like, in the garden and it was weird it was just it's one of those things hard to explain even to the, even to my therapist is like i remember taking a photograph of my sister and my mum in the garden and that just flashed up and i remember my black labrador you know playing with him and stuff like that it was just weird but you know it's it's one of those things where you think that's it you know you, you, you're saying your your farewell to yourself and you know, I mean, I, I didn't half. It, I didn't expect to get out. He thought he was going to die. Uh, See, when you pushed him in the canal, were you trying to kill him? Didn't give a fuck. Excuse me, I did not give two monkeys. As far as I was concerned, get in there. You put a knife to a baby and a mum. I don't care what happens to you. But I didn't try to kill him. It was more like, I, I thought you're going to get, get in there. You're going to get soaking wet. And you've got to get all the way back to red. And you're going to be freezing your tits off. A careless, a careless action could have caused his death, but I wasn't trying to kill him. I accept that, and I'm, I'm telling that openly. My thought pattern was, you're going to suffer, and now you're going to be cold. Mm. So a bit of punishment. It's all punishment, not murder. Uh, luckily, he got out, and a bloke walking along with his dog found him and uh, called the police and took him to the hospital. It's... It really is, is, I mean, it, the relationship with his daughter, they really knew, never understood the impact of my actions on him and how it impacted on them. So you can sit in prison for a crime you've done, 20 odd years get released later by the time I got went away for the murder, then meet the person you've kidnapped and then find out what I'm telling you here now. Then that has a massive transformation on me in my life, although I'm a reformed person now to a certain degree, I have to accept you've still got demons in you that would, don't agree with a lot of things. Um, but I really do believe that what I did to him has affected me massively in, in my thought pattern and how I am as a person now, M more so for what I did to him, but going forward. And it would definitely affect other people if they was to meet the victims of their crimes at an early age and see that person in front of him. He broke down crying in restorative justice when I met him. And uh, it was very powerful. It was in a dark, dingy little hall. 
Cold, cold, wasn't it, Will? Cold. Oh, cold, man. I mean, my clock went that small. I know. I don't want to get too wet. Don't worry. And um, and then I said, come on, Will. Do you want, and when we left, well, I'll give him a cuddle on that. And I said, a uh, big hug. I said, how are you getting home? He said, I'm getting a train. I said, do you want a lift? And he looked at me. I said, come on, let's go and get something to eat. So it took him to get something to eat. I said, do you want a lift, mate? He goes, all right, Kevin, yeah. He took me to his home where he lived and dropped him off. And then, since then, we've been building on the trust and the relationship because it's still very difficult for him. You have to understand that. But he felt comfortable enough to get into my car with me after that, but still suffers massively. Does not does not deflect from what I've done to him and it's how it still affects him now. But in the restorative justice, we had a judge there, uh, someone from restorative justice as well, uh, my former ex who was there, so there was a lady present now. She was in the car as well. She wasn't on her own. She was, you know, she, she was quite, she's a pleasant, friendly, pretty lady. Uh, that would have must have made you feel better. Should have got to sit on your lap, mate. Should have done. <laughs> <laughs> Reminded that. Reminded that, would you? <laughs> See, um, when you get pushed into the canal, though, well, what's going through your mind? That, that's the, the key point, because when, uh, with the bash to the head, I was, I was actually out, I saw the, Bright, out, of, out of the three white lights I saw that that was the fourth and that was the brightest of all and I remember my face burning but I didn't know you'd see yes gas me until I'd found out but what what happened was when I got hit I saw the light I, I felt my face burning and then the next thing I knew I'd actually I was underwater and I was splashing around and then I thought of like, got on for some reason I managed to get under under the bridge, and I heard the car speeding off. And then that's when I started sort of thinking I've got to get out of here before it gets. It was fucking freezing the water because it was March and it was like it was it, it was actually ice cold water. And but what the what the dogs was reckoning was it, I had uh, a shock. Basically, that with the, hitting the cold water, you could either. A die with hitting the cold water or it could jolt you to make you come back and that's what happened to me and it was one of those like i was under the water and it was like <sighs> life you know you're coming out of the water and that's when i thought i have to get out of here and uh, basically i floated a little bit down i followed the stream and then to the other side of the bridge and then got out I actually got out and but i hid for about four or five hours because every car went past i he thought crawled. it was coming back he yeah, crawled. Yeah, crawled crawled across the road uh, hid behind this like bush I could see two houses in the distance but I thought and every time I heard a car they're coming back to check to see make sure I'm gone I'm dead and every, that was going through and then it's, I think it was about six half six in the morning I actually got enough courage to get across the road and start knocking on people's doors and the bloke that opened the door thought I'd been hit by a car even the ambulance crew turned up thought I'd been hit by a car because uh, the amount of injuries yeah. I had. Uh, Were you drinking or taking drugs then? No, no, no. I was, uh, I was, uh, as I was a youngin, I was uh, going to raves. I was doing ecstasy. You know, I was in, in heavily into the trance scene, club scene. So I was doing drugs, but not every day. It was more Friday, Saturday night. You know, mm. with friends and that, and getting pissed up, and then going to the raves. And that was my, yeah. that was my scene at the time. How would you have felt, Kev, if you'd caught him once you found out he was innocent? Oh God, blimey! You, you can't put that into words in terms of uh, I, uh, look, hurting people who deserve it pretty much doesn't leave an impact on me. I think you're a nasty bastard. You deserve all you got. Let's face it, the police can't protect everybody, which is why people go, used to go to people like me. Um, uh, and I'd just like to say as well that not deflecting from what you've just said is that I've only been arrested for one other kidnapping, okay? And I've kidnapped a few people. And they, they justly deserve what they've done, what I've what I done to them. Um, apart from the murder as well. So I have to say that the people that I had kidnapped previously never went to the police because if they knew what they'd done was wrong in the first instance. So I'd never had any impact on my moral standing and what I'd done. But for what I did to him, if I'd have found out he was innocent, and I think it would have really, really, I think it would have changed me in a sense where 
I don't know how I would have handled it, but it would have been very bad. I think it would have affected me mentally in that it would have eaten away at me because things like that eat away at me, as in thinking he'd put a knife to a baby, that would eat away at me because it stems from my brother getting bullied as a child when he, he got run over by a bus and uh, run over f running out from behind the bus. Um, so bullying comes very bad for me, but people must say I'm a bully. Well, I'm not actually a bully. I stand up to bullies. But they can't be seen a bully in that way. Because you called me a bully once, Will, didn't you? And I said, so I'm not a fucking bully, Will. And I stood my ground with him then, but he still be a bully. <laughs> Fair play to him and all. But, um, and that's, that shows how he's come forward. But yeah, I can only just say to you, honestly, it would have really, really messed my head up. Because mm -hmm. I think, God, you think you're so righteous. And look what you've done now. But... <sighs> I still ruined his life. I have to live with that. But in the sense that I'm trying to make it better now and and in the right so in the right best way I can. And now we've met, he understands that I'm not such he, the the picture he had in his brain of me, oh, can you imagine what he must have thought of me, can't you? And and what type of grotesque person I was. And probably still some people may think I am a grotesque person, but now he's met me and he, and he sees the difference between what I did to the person I am when I'm like we are now, calm and collective. Uh, it doesn't resonate with what I did to him. Only now he thinks about what I was told about what he did. That helps him to justify in his head why I did it. But then he has to ask the questions is, well, why me? Well, because he was put forward by his colleagues and people in the area. So, when I used to say, like, I came like the wrong person, me, I did, but I didn't. So, uh, yeah, it would have really, really affected me, as it has done now, which is why I want to put it right. But, I mean, look, today, we want to got his hair cut in Swells Barbers in Hillingdon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he looks 10 years younger. Uh, looked a lot older before this. <laughs> yeah. I was going to take him for a sunbed, okay, in, in the hair field in the beach house. I thought, you're going to have a sunbed, and then you're going to have your hair cut. That's how where we are now. And uh, I went for a coffee with him the other day before this. I said, come and have a coffee. Because he's nervous as anything about coming on here today, James. And I, I understand that. And I said, come on, you'll be all right, James. He's great. Um, it's a right nice setup, And I think it would do you good to get it off your chest, to let people know your story. And further from that, there's some... You have to try and look on the positives of stuff. And God, I'm not trying to make it right again. But Will's been asked to be an ambassador for uh, restorative justice. They think his case is so unique. But do you know what he did? He goes, well, there's a double. He said, oh, I come as a team. He said, I'm not to me. He said, it's Kevin Lane as well. I said, really? Would he appear? He goes, yeah, but I had no idea about that until today. Mm -hmm. He said, no, you want me? You have to have Kevin and all. I mean, come on. What does that show about? If people could do restorative justice in the manner that we and Will have done it, look where we are right now and how that affects me and how it's affected him. Yeah. Uh, so it's massive yeah, to even be here well man it shows you your character it shows you how brave you are and I, I love Kev to bits and Kev knows this and, but Kev's got characteristics and his presence his mannerisms he's still fucking scary I like a wind up and that but I think should I say certain things because <laughs> in case I end up in the back he's fucking but yeah, no. because he, he's got that presence now I've interviewed a lot of mad bastards and Kev's up there is oh I'm not going to fuck with him like yeah. it's, uh, it's these mannerisms there's, there's something there where you know okay he's dangerous you just know like when he's talking when you're sitting him across from him he's still obviously there's a bit of trust there but obviously because if I feel that and like I say, we're friends. I, I wonder how you would feel when you know. Well, it's like Kevin said that restorative justice. Uh, basically, uh, when I met Kevin, and when I when I heard him say he got it wrong and he he was sorry, my I don't know what happened to 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 my head, but I was blob and I was just yeah, burst into tears. tears. Yeah. I just I just couldn't control myself. I was just, but then. I went to the therapist the day afterwards and she said that what that was was oh, almost 30, 30 years of build-up of hearing that he's sorry, basically. And it was just hearing that, just clicked it and I just went into one and I was like drooling and crying my eyes out and snot was running out. I just literally, I just... Oh, I felt terrible when you Couldn't fathom, yeah. you know, like, like he's, he's, he's sorry for what he'd done. Basically, seeing you were in the canal when you, you got out and you were waiting for four or five hours, what happened after that? 
Oh, um, I was uh, taken to ho- taken to hospital. Uh, initially, um, I, they, I was a jo- uh, what's it called a John Doe. They were calling me John Doe because they didn't, didn't, I had no idea on me. Literally, the night I go out without my wallet, with nothing other than a packet of cigarettes and um, some tobacco, and um, the phone number that Kevin had was a friend of mine who um, had a new phone and he wrote his number and I'd actually put it inside the packet of cigarettes and it was the only dry bit of thing when they pulled it, once they searched my clothes. But um, I just, uh, when it, when I come out of hospital, it was a case of, you know, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't work out why, why me, basically, why, why all this, why I went through all of this, and it just. But when I was in hospital, it was a two or three days of just staring at the wall, and people looking at you. Okay, what's your name? Can you remember anything? And then I think it was the second day I started remembering things. I said, Yeah, I, I live in Reading. I got Reading, and they were going, okay. And the police were saying that, because they thought I'd been in a road traffic accident. And of course, once they'd found the number, they'd rung it, and it was a friend of mine. He goes, yeah, he's been missing for three days. He, he was uh, taken, and that's when it all started. Mm-hmm. It, they asked, asked me, start asking me questions, like, you know. When did you find out, Kev, it was the wrong person? <clears throat> About two weeks after I kidnapped him. Uh, I'd see ID come and arrest me. Um, and it just reminded me actually there. So uh, I had a security company at the time. I had 120 blokes working for me. I was 1992, 91. Uh, so I wasn't that old to have such a large security firm at the time. And if you needed doorman, they had to be doorman. They were there for a reason. So. In the papers, the son said security boss Kevin Lane. So he had that on his head and all that he'd been kidnapped by a security boss who's got a load of blokes working for him. So that must have had some bearing on his thought pattern. They come and arrested me, took me to Reading Magistrates Court, kept me in the cells a few days. I didn't talk to him, didn't even talk, just didn't, you know, no cup of tea, nothing. Back of the car, nothing. All right. uh, got to Reading. Went to the court, reminded, reminded my best mate. I shouldn't laugh about that. Reminded my best mate. And um, my best mate goes to me. Listen, you can't perform in here like you perform outside. What are you fucking talking about? I'll tell you this little story. It's a bit of humour. So we've gone into the holding tank, two holding tanks. I'm sitting there. He's done balls on everything, my best mate. Went to school in Oxford, an old, real clever bastard. He's a bit of a rough diamond. So... His kids started rolling a spliff. I know my mate smoked. And I know he meant to leave everything back from people, right? So at the time I've gone into Reading, I've gone into Reading prison, and this sort of thing's happening, it's distracting me. So you've gone into, oh, I'm in prison now, and um, this fella, I said, don't you meant to leave that for people, mate? So although I've been reminded for kidnapping, I've still got a thought pattern about me, well, what's right's wrong, what's wrong's wrong. He went, no, I'm taking it home with me. My mate's twitching and all sorts. And he's going, geezer got up and gone in the tank next door. He's going, Kevin, Kevin. I'm out the bleeding chair and I out off the bench. I've gone into him on the next cell. I said, see you. I said, if you don't give me that puff, I said, I'm going to eat you that many times you think you're surrounded. Now fucking hand it over. <laughs> and he gave me the puff. <laughs> I went back in the tank and give it to the lads. So all I'd been remanded for kidnapping, I've gone into prison and I'm still behaving as if I was on the street. And I can t- carry it on that way. What I would... I had a few problems in the prison in terms of other people and the way they're behaving. So it didn't impact on me in that manner. And I still thought what I'd done was right. Justifying it. Justifying it for many, many years until I met him. And then when I met him, I thought, my God, what have I done to that man? And I tell people all the time, you've got no idea what I did to him. I ruined his life. I tell people all the time. I told my nephew, Teddy, the weekend. So I ruined a man's life by my actions. How do you think your life would have been if you never went through that kidnapping and torture? Oh, I'd probably be married, four kids, a couple of dogs living in the country, happily, you know, mental health free, you know, no worries. But it's like when you get to the junction, you can go left or right. I think that night I went left, you know, but um, 
no, I've, I've, I feel as I would have probably been in business at some point, you know, my own business, because that's what, I, what, that's what I've always wanted to do, was like run my own business, you know, be a businessman and sort of like work for myself rather than others. But that never I've ended up for the rest of my life just working for others and, you know, working under their ruling rather than my own. So Not holding a job down for too long, no, moving not, on all the time. Yeah, moving on. Um, I had a, a spate where I, I was lucky enough to actually get a job with a construction company at I travel around the UK, sort of like projects for two, three years in length, so mechanical, electrical projects. So I was finding myself in Kilroot for three years, Northern Ireland, uh, Edinburgh, uh, up in Scotland, uh, the North East Coast, you know, Norwich, Germany, all them places, but working on projects. Mm -hmm. On that, And that was a distraction, basically. But as soon as uh, the, the company uh, finished trading, it, I took my redundancy and that's when I sort of thought, well, this is easier if I can find the same job, but I couldn't. Uh, all I was finding was like nine to fives and basically, you know, I just, after two or three weeks, I was, I just couldn't, ha I couldn't hack it. I was, it was too many people, I was getting paranoid in the office and because I wasn't sort of like technically in charge, someone else was in charge and I didn't trust anybody. So I would just mm. make excuses and resign or phone in sick or just, you know, or mm -hmm. until they got annoyed with me for not turning up. So. Everything that you've went through, uh, the torture, the kidnapping, being innocent about it, but then your mental health goes, you end up an addict, you end up homeless. Does part of you ever think or wish that Kev had just killed you that day? Um, I'd, in, a, in a way, yeah, but it was a, a stage in 93 where I attempted my own life. So... So, but I took six bars out of my own, drunk half a bottle of vodka and I woke up I was thinking this would be it thank god it was only six are you yeah, yeah. I just I, I don't want to go back there I, I, it annoys me I even stupidly even thought of doing something as stupid as that that night but I just it got to a stage where I couldn't handle it anymore it was just constant every time you know barricade myself in my room you know, anybody coming to the door, because I was living in shared accommodation, I was thinking, is that them? Is that them? Or bangs at the night. I, I would wake up and that would be me. I wouldn't go sleep again. I, I, even to this day, I wake up between three and four o'clock in the morning. I can't go shopping anymore because all the shops are closed. They don't open them since COVID. But what I used to do was when I would get up, I would get up and do my shopping. I would go out four three, four o'clock in the morning, knowing that no one's going to be about. The only people it's going to be about are police. And the amount of times I got stopped by the police at night, said, where are you going? I've gone shopping. All right, okay. What you got on you? I said, I'll be treated again. And I've, so I've lived life with that. So, Can, you, can I just ask you, please, Will, to uh, reflect on when you was in, in how the police, what they said to you about, you think that was bad, what we're going to do to you and stuff like that. This is a victim who's nearly been killed and yet the police were threatening him with... Well, you take well, the lead. Yeah, well, when they picked me up from the hospital, uh, the journey to the to Redden police station was worse than the journey with Kevin. The, the constant, you think, you think what he did to you, we can cut, we can make you disappear. Where's the, where's the money? Where is it? Constant. Oh, they, it was worse than what he was put, they, they, but it was legal what they were doing. As where what Kevin put me through was illegal, but they were doing it the legal way. We don't believe you. We don't believe you. We never believe anybody. And that's, they just kept on going on and on and pressurising. And then when they realised, oh, done. You know what I mean? You've just sat through like nearly an hour and a half of this and we're not getting anywhere. How did that make you feel that you had nobody to turn to? Uh, I, I just felt lost. I just, you know, I was, again, like, why me? Why, why are people saying this about me? What have I done? It took me back to the bully days of school. Yet, you know, what I mean, let's bully Billy because that's what I was known at the time. Billy, let's bully Billy. Let's send, let's send Billy a birthday card, but let's put dog shit in it and post it through his front door. You know, and I was just thinking, why me? Why? What have I done to people to deserve this? Why have I got something written on my forehead? Thief, you know, criminal, you know, you know, I mean. I don't know, I just can't fathom it, but I'm hoping that people will realise now, you know what I mean, that I'm not, I'm not a bad person. Yeah, we know. can see that, man. My heart, actually, my heart goes out to you, man. And it, it, 
And I was involved, so I don't know. And I know you're a soft guy as well, Kev, underneath all that madness. I know you've got a big heart, so when you're hearing that, how does it make you feel? I mean, the whole, most of my path in life has been down to my brother being bullied at school due to the, the accident he had, as, as I've said before. And then most of my, what I've done to people in the in the past, to pretty much all of it, is due to injustices that the police weren't able to rectify. Um, so to hear, to meet Will, and to know what type of man he is, now I've got to know him. Oh, so sad. So sad, you know. Because um, I've always thought it was a bit of a John Wayne, fight for the underdog. Um, uh, let's face it, we can't be protected by the police in this country anymore. They're so overrun and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I do see myself still as a bit of that in terms of, you know, people look to someone who can look after them and, maybe be a bit of a, a negotiator when people are falling out and say, oh, come on. So I don't know where this could go or I don't so. But uh, I'm not justifying it, by the way, but um, it doesn't make me feel good. I can't justify it in my head. I cannot justify it in my head. I say to myself what I did to him. They've got an angel on this side saying, well, you thought what you were doing was right. And then over it's, yeah, but look what you did to him. Look how he is now. So the devil over here might be saying to me, yeah, look what you did to him. I'll take that as a positive and say, yeah, look what I did to him so I can do some benefit in my head, not what you wanted to do bad. Do you understand what I mean by that? I'll take what he said and think, well, hold on, look. What you, you're making me realise what I did more than my own head when I'm battling with my good, bad, good, bad. Um to hopefully do better for other people in, in terms of the restorative justice, being ambassador on that, because it has been massive to me. It's massively thought about, God, do I want my son to go and do that to people? No, I don't. Do I want my son to go on my path? No, I don't. Or my son, should I say. Thankfully, the elders still haven't. But it's had a massive impact on me, uh, 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 Al. Um, thinking about my life in the past, massively thinking about things all the time. I did, it's all the time I'm, I'm thinking about this stuff. More so when I meet Will, again, or we have contact via the phone or something, you know, he messaged me, what's happening with James? And um, we went to Channel 4 about doing a documentary of a story of justice. That would be really powerful. And I think that would be great for many people, both sides of the fence. Yeah, that's as powerful just you two sitting here today. I don't you realise how powerful this is going to be for people to understand the effects that it has on not just bullying, but just the torture and the misery that people have to go through and the pain of the ripple effect of the whole, you've got to question now everything that you've done in your life, all the, all the motives, all the justifying, because even if somebody did deserve it, even if they've got a wife or kids, the effect it has on them, yeah. their brothers or sisters or yeah. mums or dads, even though, listen, if somebody stole money, they deserve a kick in the ball, don't get me wrong, but it's when they go home to the family life and they're scared and they're peeking through the blinds and then they turn to drink, they turn to drugs, they're suicidal, they're hating themselves, they're blaming themselves because it sounds as if, no disrespect, well, but you've been a victim your whole life. Yeah, and you're right in what you say, James, uh, with family, I disassociated myself with my family because I didn't want and I hope they'll understand this now. I didn't want any association with them. It, Kevin or his colleagues would find where my family were living. Because you, you hear the, you hear rumours that they, they get you, they go down the, the family chain until you extinct, basically. And this was going through my head. So if I don't talk to my sisters, have no contact, then he ain't going to know about my sisters. He's, I have to keep myself to myself, become a loner, you know, recluse you know, have no friends, which I have got. You can count my friends on one hand, basically. And that's the way I looked at life. That's the way I sort of think. Then I sort of like built my relationship back with my family after I'd, I call it my dark period, because it was um, five years of my life that I'll never get back after the incident. That was homeless, homelessness, that was drink, that was drugs. And that was just basically five years of, you know, like wander around with a cloud in my head, constantly thinking, why me? And looking for the next bottle of vodka or the next bottle of special brew or the next 
ate for the next wrap of coke you know like working to to feed my habits and it just got to a stage where it just i can't continue this way i need to you know and it, i knew i got i got a phone call from the police in 94 saying um that kevin been sent he'd been sent to prison for murder and basically he'll walk in there it, but he'll come out feet first. He'll spend the rest. He'll probably end up getting killed in jail. So he said, the police said to me, well, you can just calm down now. You can relax. He's gone. But I never relaxed. And, it, and it's never going to go away. You know what I mean? No matter what drugs you take to block it out, it yeah. just ain't going to happen. But that's why I call my dark period. That's where the suicide, the homeliness, you know, like the things that I went through, people don't understand because there is a big void in my life between 92 and 97 because mm -hmm. i was going to ask that when kev got done and presented of prison did it make it easier but obviously it didn't and why didn't you reach out to him quicker once you realized it was the wrong guy i didn't know until we done the story of justice no way i'm telling I you i found out a few weeks later that it was he was innocent no he did he told me I told him it was, yeah, it was all uh, through restorative justice. All right, I thought you knew a few weeks no, later. No, no, I knew a few weeks later when I got nicked that I'd been nicked for it. But uh, I didn't know till years later. All right. that Will told me it weren't him, it was his, the geezer in the stores working with him. And that what he went through with the police and everything else, what I did to his life. I say to people now, I ruined his life. I destroyed his life for years. And I say that to people and I say it with like... Because I want people to realise, to, 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 to understand people's actions. So no, I, I, I didn't know. See, if you did do it, would you, do you think you would have got on with your life better? Well, if I, if I did stay Yeah. Uh, I would have taken it on the chin. the chin and moved on with my life and probably mm -hmm. done what the bloke did, left the country just to get out of any, any sort of like, you know, comeback. What is historical justice for people who don't know? Oh, um, what it is, is um, it's basically where like, the victims of crime can meet the actual perpetrators of that crime. Mm -hmm. And it's basically down to the individual, not mo not so much the victim. It can be flipped both ways. It, it can be like Kevin can ask to see me or I can ask to see um, Kevin. But it's a long process. It took about just over a year and a bit to actually get the face to face because you had to go through a lot of like interviews and security, basically, because... I remember Martin saying to me, uh, I don't want you flying at him with a gun or a knife, so we have to make sure that you're, you're going to be calm, stable and calm enough to do it. But Whose idea was it? It was, it was mine through my therapist. Uh, she said, for closure, the best thing I can recommend, because it was one of those therapies where it's usually a six-week program, but I ended up having 17 weeks' worth of therapy every week. Were you the week. longest? Your longest, yeah, in the... Uh, the the Surrey matters. Was uh, that the first you'd ever done therapy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that like? The first time really going in, in depth and speak. Was that the first time you'd ever proper sp spoke yeah. about it? Yeah, it was um, hard. It was emotional, um, but it made sense the way they were, the, the, the way they dealt with me. Basically, describing the brain as a filing cabinet, and what's happened is you've opened it and everything's blown out. So now let's start refiling <laughs> everything into an order. And basically the last order of that was restorative justice, basically, like putting closure, meeting the individual who hurt me and who's still hurting me today. Well, not so much hurt me at the time, who hurt me, but was hurting me then. What but, are you thinking then when your therapist says that? All the years of hurt and torment, taking your try to take your life, homelessness, ruined family, ruin your chance of having kids and a wife and the business. What are you thinking? I was heading, believe it or not, I was, I was heading back to the dark days. That's where I could see myself going. Because what I'd noticed when I was, and rather have a glass of wine, I was drinking a bottle of wine. And then that bottle of wine went to two, and I was like, "Whoa, you're going down the dark road again." You know, next thing you'll be doing the popping the pills and doing the crack and all sorts of stuff. And I didn't want to do it, and I just thought, I've got to do this. I have to do this, and. If he says no, he says no. I was going to actually pen him a letter and just explain to him in a letter as well, because that was the other option after, if it was a no, you could actually write to them. To them. But, but from that day, it's been the most 
best experience I've ever had. It's 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 closed things for me. It's made it's made me see sense now. I don't. I I, ask, I still ask myself why me, but I now understand why why it was me that night. It was chosen, and the reason why, and uh, the remorse that Kevin's got. With his actions that night, what he done to me. Yeah, even though Kevin's dangerous, or I interview a lot of criminals as well, who are very, very dangerous. But you're braver than any one of them. Just so you know that, for you to sit there and just want to meet the guy who basically was fucking trying to kill you. Like we all know how ruthless people can be, but mm. to you then, what to face that? That's a strength, isn't it, Kev? That's yes, a fucking massive. courage. Yeah. Well, people were saying to me at the time, that like, you know, I'm a good. F contact with a friend from the incident who was I've known from right through from 90, 1990 right through up until this present day and when I told him I was meeting Kevin he goes why do you want to meet that scumbag for what he put you through I said he's not a scumbag I said he has reason it's got to be a reason behind it and understanding that reason and the reason is he got it wrong and he's remorseful and I, I, I'm accepting that I'm not I don't, I'm not one for holding grudges Unbelievable yeah. he is. Why well, did you, what am I going to yeah. do? Stalk him and kill him? <laughs> and then yeah. me do 30 years, bird. Why did you agree to it, Kev? Because I, I wanted to meet the man that I kidnapped and um, hear what he had to say about why it happened. And I thought it would do me good. As crazy as that said, I thought it, it, you need to listen to someone uh, and hear what he has to say about what you've done to him. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a case of it was for the better rather than the worst. I, I was uh, in myself. I, I, I've got compassion, and I thought I need to hear what this man has to say. I didn't think much about at the, when they asked me with story of justice, and I heard that he had asked for it. I thought well, I owe it to him, and I went based on, on that reason alone that I owe it to him to sit in front of him to give it to me. And I thought that he was going to be quite abusive, quite attacking. You've done this, you've done that, you horrible bastard. Because they said to me, with start of justice, listen, it, it's kicked off in some of these meetings before. We've had to get in between people and people tried to hurt people and, you know, stuff like that. Not, not too much of that, but there's been problems along the way. So I had that vision in my head, but I thought, well, I'm prepared to go there and take that. Um, but in case it's turned out for, for the better, for Will, more so than me, how he's now thinking he's going on with his life. I mean, he doesn't have a beard anymore. He's cut the beard off. Looks a lot younger with the hair cut. Mm -hmm. But um, he's now moving on with his life, and he's he's a lot happier, and he does things now that he wouldn't he wasn't doing before. Surely anybody who's committed such an atrocious crime, and they know they're in the wrong, do restorative justice. Do it for the better of you, but more so for the person what you've done to because there's two people who need repairing in this and it's myself for the right reasons and will definitely more so for the right reasons prior to myself but it shows collectively as an, an offender and a victim how he can both see the not he sees the light now for how he's leading his life better now and he's getting rid of the baggage that he's been carrying around that I caused for me it definitely makes you think about your actions how much does it then soften you up to then look at your whole life and your whole outlook and the shit that you've done because men are very good at putting everything to the side and blocking everything out we don't want to feel pain and emotion but even today I can see the emotion in your face so how much has this made you question everything in your whole life and how's it like you said it's made a massive impact on you to then Massive. seeing the damage that you've done? I don't think I would have been the man I, uh, I turned out to be if I'd had a father around for the first instance. And many people say, oh, that's an easy excuse. Well, no, if you've got a dad around, most people who go to prison don't have dads around, high percentage of them. So they go away with life. Mine was brother, not having a dad around. Um, I think there's a lot to be thought about that. But I believe that... Regret's a big word. Of course I regret some of the things I've done to two people in particular. Really, just two. And that's, I've done a lot of things for a lot of people. So to only have two, um, and that's two more than it should have been. <coughs> it's really, I think about it all the time as the answer to that. And I think about my younger son now and how 
I go over and above to make sure that boy is is is, is not going to be like his dad, make the mistakes that I made. Like he is like his dad because nature and nurture. I've seen things in my son now. I thought, oh my god, that explains. There we go. If you start to answer the question there. I see things in my son that explains why I am the way I am. So I say to people, don't tread on my toes or I'll stamp on yours. So a couple of months ago, my little boy, he's six, <laughs> tread on my toes messing around. I said, who are you? Don't do that. And I put my toe on his toe, right? You went, <laughs> stamped on my toe straight away. He said, don't do that to me. And I thought, my God, he's just like his dad. Don't touch me because I will come back at you. And he is the sweetest boy. He's been brought up exceptionally well by his mother and his grandparents and his aunties and such, and he's the school favourite by the teachers and got lots of friends and the girls chase him a lot apparently, <laughs> which I love for, for him to say. He says, yeah, dad, did they chase me? I said, did the girls chase you? He went, yeah, as if he was shocked. I went, oh, I'm not shocked. But nature and nurture, it's given me, um, it's, un it's made me understand a lot about myself, What after what I've done to Will meeting him, really has, so. And it will continue to do that. And I hope it helps other people going forward to sit down and have the courage, put your hands down your pants and find your bollocks, is what I say to them, and step forward and say, I want to meet my victim, if the victim hasn't come forward already. Because it will be transformation. It'll be life-changing for you for the better. It will be. It has to be. Um, and it, hopefully it may stop you going to prison and doing a lot more good in your life and having a bit more consideration and judgment for why people do do things and make mistakes. I made a mistake, but people still like me. For all the things I've done in my life, am I a horrible bastard? No. Do I have so many decent people across the board? Judah Christie, Duncan Campbell, MPs, not through the TV, but producers who <coughs> warmly welcome me, down to basic dustmen, who say basic, but down to what people say, oh, bleeding hell, without a dustman, getting rid of our rubbish, we have a terrible country, so I respect them. But what I meant by that is a road sweeper. I stop, uh, I've stopped in the past, I haven't stopped for a while, and thanked road sweepers for doing a job that a lot of people won't do. I said, thank you for that. You've a fellow a book, he started crying. But, and what I mean by that is, do a story of justice, and I think you'll have a different outlook on life. How would you feel if your son went down the same footsteps as you? I'll use the term lightly, it would kill me. I will die before uh, I would do everything in my power to stop my son going down that, that path and, and going to prison or hurting other people. It's a life I don't want him to lead. I want him to do it, see cadets, get some structure, some discipline. I'll teach him boxing now on a bit of jiu-jitsu, he's having jiu-jitsu lessons, but I also have him magic lessons so he can learn in a magic circle. So you will have discipline where he understands the use of violence for defending yourself or it's a recognised sport, but not for inflicting pain and, and injury on people, uh, which I realised I could do from a young age. Yeah. How was it facing Kev for the first time after everything you'd put you through all those years? Whatever a story of justice. Um, it was emotional, um, but it was a relief. And hearing... Hearing him say sorry and uh, and his remorse um, made me feel a lot more comfortable and happy within myself, knowing that he, he's, he's he's sorry, he's got it wrong, and he explained that you know over. I think it was a coffee afterwards. And you generally, yeah. we yeah. generally were open. It was just yeah. truthful, isn't it, yeah, Will? Yeah, There's yeah. no no bollocks here. It's. Uh, I think it was a coffee afterwards where I I, I just realised because you know I mean it was. It was a shock afterwards, like, do you want to come for a coffee? Oh, I've only just met you. You nearly killed me years ago. But And I thought, yeah, let's go and have a chat. Let's go and have coffee. Yeah. What was the build up to then knowing that you're going to meet him? Obviously, being a bit soft and sensitive now with everything you've been through, was there times where you doubted your decision in case he finished the job off in the, in the meeting? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the couple of days before the meeting, was uh, scheduled to have a sort of like a Google Earth any place I'm going to look for. Like I know it sounds weird, but you know, like, uh, snatch points. So I was Googling around where we were going to be meeting. I thought, there's a potential snatch point, so I ain't going to get dropped off there. So I'm going to make sure I get dropped off on the main road, loads of people around, and then walk into the, ve the venue, basically. But um, the run up to it, I was, 
I was feeling again anxious and nervous and you know I mean I didn't know what to expect even though RJ told us what what to expect it could go this way or that way being good way or the bad way but I was went the good way but yeah the run up to the prior to it was it was it was a couple of sleepless nights uh you know I mean I don't think also he's watched me on podcasts did, they, yeah, did I, you see him? What you yours? thinking? I, it was it? your first one. It, it was after the Palmarama. Um, He's been everywhere, though. He's fucking TV papers, news, uh, yeah. positive, yeah. negative. Yeah. He is yeah. everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so that's the thing as well. Could you see, see when you kept seeing him? Did that flash back a lot of memories? Because it was everywhere at one point it, on the news, and even more so now. But obviously, you've sorted it. But see when you're seeing the face, does it trigger? It, at the time it did it was thing especially the panorama program and seeing like the bloke who you know like opened that car door the young photograph the young kevin that's the picture i oh, have right, don't start laughing at him <laughs> well telling <laughs> you <laughs> i'm telling you no, I've got to get that in. Yeah. you know the 21 year old yeah, kevin yeah. is what i see but now i look at and we're both 56 you know i mean both for 21 but when i look at kevin i don't see the 56 year old kevin i see the 21 year old kevin and it sounds weird and that's the image it's burnt into my mm -hmm. eyes but then when i was after the panorama program i was physically mentally sick i had stomach i had to go toilet and everything it was just like everything what out of me and that's when it all kicked off again but, but after that i actually googled kevin lane and then you popped up and it was like uh a podcast and then i watched a bit where he was talking about what he'd done to me and i don't know if you if you play it back but just the emotion i could look at looking into his eyes on that screen i think he's sorry you know i, I could see remorse then and then I, I, and that's when i started thinking well hold on i'm i'm starting to go back down to the dark days now i need to prevent this so but this was in 2015 and it took took me like a number of years to actually, it wasn't a case of I'm bringing restorative justice tomorrow. I, I sat down, I thought about it, I risk assessed it, I looked at, you know, I mean, what about, did a lot of research into risk, uh, restorative justice and uh, looked at a load of, like, there, there is a couple of podcasts out there about restorative justice, but not this way. It was more the meeting, basically, but not the after, after the meeting. So I watched a load of them and, uh, I took the decision to contact victim support and go down the, the route because that's your channel in unless you contact uh, a, a charity called Why Me Charity Restorative Justice um, and they'll sort it all out for you. But I went through victim support and went through that and that's how we got through with Martin. And Martin was absolutely amazing gentleman. Yeah. He, uh, the whole process it's so easy to understand and it and it helps with his voice as well yeah so talk, you to, oh what's me think yeah. the same as you will yeah so d a gentle and yeah. calm and m m yeah. mel melodic maybe it's yeah maybe and what i found was uh he wasn't trying not to arrange a meeting but it was a case of are you sure you want to do this are you are you sure and he was explaining what it could have how it could go good or bad as as he's seen mm -hmm. We went the good way. See, because obviously when Kev was in prison, he was doing a lot of appeals. He was still on the news. He was still everywhere. Could because no, I, I, I was you away from it all. I was away from us. When I did, didn't watch you must news. have been looking to find out when we, when he was getting out. Were you thinking when he gets out, he was going to come back? At the time, years ago, I did, and I thought well, that's why I got the job to move around the country. You know what I mean? That's why I, I didn't establish myself in a town longer in a year basically so i would like, work on a project for a year and then move on to another project so there was no traceability friends the friends that i made on that project for that year i disassociated on the next project i didn't I, in case they got questioned or did you have will clearly working here yeah yeah where's he working now? so i disassociated myself so they don't know where i'm working so that's how i went on and on but um i never used to watch the news um for about 20 years so and it didn't it didn't dawn on me it was just that, that that evening in that hotel flicking through the channels and that was the time it, 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 i'd saw kevin in the boat since the trial really what were you thinking kev seeing Will for the first time it wasn't until i heard some of the facts about what had really happened there that it was it was a realization of 
oh my God. And when I first met him, I thought, okay, blimey, he doesn't, in my head, he was quite a little bit stockier then, um, young bloke like me. Not uh, 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 an older person looking like he's had a bit of a hard life. And I thought, my God, I couldn't, you know, envisage me doing that to him now. Certainly that was the first thing. And I thought, blimey, he looks like, he looks worried. He looks like he's, he, he looks nervous. And he definitely looks like he's, he's had a bit of a hard time, to say the least. Um, and it was more, well, let's wait and see where this goes. I don't know what he's going to say till he opens his mouth. Is he going to absolutely just give it to me, which I've got to sit there and take it? Respectfully, just sit there and shut my mouth and let him say what he wants to say to me. Give it to me. Whatever you want to say, just give it to me. And uh, if it helps him, then... So I had many thoughts going through my mind. Um, it was really dark and dingy. It wasn't like in here. It was in a proper old, like... Church hall, wasn't church it? Church hall, but it was... Uh, Mormons, was it? Mormons, Mormons yeah. use it. And nothing about that, but it was cold. It had been heated up and all big drapey curtains, dark curtains. And you know when you get a cold room, they've been used for bleeding months or whatever. Maybe a week or so, but you know, it gets used for an hour or two once a week in the evening. I don't know, but it was like that. So that is doom and gloom. I thought they could have had a warmer place to make it settle in more, not like a dungeon type. Would you agree? It's sort of like oh, yeah. old castle dungeon type feeling. I didn't think the surroundings were too very good. It wasn't clinically um, sterile. It had an aura it, it about it. Um, and I had that feeling. I thought, blimey, we could have picked somewhere better than this. Mm. Um, and then obviously we, I was in one room we was in another we was brought into the room I had to wait for him to come in we had to sit down and we were seated in a certain position they, they put the position the chairs around um, so it was I think the surroundings would have made it more friendlier will warmer friendlier types of yeah more definitely. more if you're sitting down like if you're hosting in a city like you've got uh, over it in a house or up like there and that um more cozy more relaxed not oh, now it's freezing in here my god like death is cold isn't it mm -hmm. them sort that's the type of or oh, feeling i had i felt oh, god this ain't good uh, and then then he's, he's getting upset because of I remember when I didn't see my children for years in prison and I came home and my ex was, was acting in a manner that I consider just absolutely atrocious uh, and stopped me seeing my son for the same reasons. And I had a, a time when I just absolutely just broke. And I don't mind saying that. I could do strip boxes <laughs> for long periods of time, naked, shivering, I get hit by coshes, all sorts, wrapped up, bent up, you name it, all that. Never broke me at all. Just for you bastards, I'll have you next time. But seeing Will going for what he did and letting him come out of himself, I had that for not seeing my sons. And I see that in in Will. And it made me think about myself, how I'd, uh, uh, I became a broken shell. And it made me think about how I felt when I didn't see my son and then didn't see my sons in prison. Uh, it made me have a bit more understanding of how he felt and the pain that I caused him. So, restorative justice really does work. I'm telling you, it works. It's, uh, no, it definitely works, and I, I, I champion it, really do champion it. Yeah, because you're still sitting here. How was it when all those years, all the misery you went through, all the torture, all the pain, for then Kev to say sorry? It was like a, a pressure relief valve going off inside my head, and basically, that like, it was just it was just nice to hear, you know, from from Kevin that he's sorry and he got it wrong. 
that's that was enough for me and i thought i, I don't hold grudges i'm not one of it well all right fair enough thank you goodbye I, I want to you know build a relationship with kevin you know become friends you know yeah do things together did you, know you know trust I mean? him when he says that i do yeah i t yeah yeah i get in the car with him so and that's that's a big that's a biggie with me let me ask you i'll bet he'd phone me up if he had a bit of egg hopefully that's going to open doors what sort of what do you do uh, I'm, um, I work for a mechanical electrical contractor, okay. operations and compliance manager. So it's just for anybody watching, maybe give you a job or give you a helping hand because you fucking deserve it. Does, yeah. You deserve it, man, by all means. Like I've interviewed so many brave people, people who's been human traffic, but for the ordeal you went through and being innocent, destroying your life, being homeless, trying to take your own life, you deserve a break, mate. And hopefully this is the, the moment yeah. it does. And Kev, like I say, he's a good guy he's sitting here. This is embarrassing for some men to admit that they've put other people through misery and pain. That's how I've got nothing but respect for yourself to even oh, be here. Like to, for him to sit here and admit that he's sorry and be brave enough to say, man, he's tortured and kidnapped a guy? That's fucking nuts. I had him for hours. Yeah. I had him for hours. And don't believe me, it weren't no joyride. Um, he might have been in the back, but he, that, he got beaten when he was in the back and he continuously got beaten. That was a terrible ordeal. The guards were running him over. The ordeal didn't stop when he got put back in the motor. He got hit with that car a lot. And I say that angry at myself in terms of I want people to understand there's no light experience that he went through. It was full on for the full amount of time I had him in that motor, under it and in the canal. So believe me, when he talks to you about how it impacts on his life and the nightmares he's had and everything else, he bloody means it. I'm not obviously sticking up for Kev or justifying what he's done, but he genuinely thought that you'd held a, a knife to a woman and a baby. You know what I mean? That is a no-go, so I can understand why he's done it, but then obviously when he finds out it's the wrong person, can you understand why he'd done what he'd done as well, even though it was wrong? It was the wrong person? At the time, I didn't understand. But now, like, speaking to Kevin and, you know, the talking and understand watching the podcasts not just yours but other podcasts and seeing the build up and getting to understand through podcasts that he got it wrong that, that's that's what that's why i'm talking to him because i know he got it wrong and uh you know i mean we have a hopefully one day we'll we'll we will get over it yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh you know i mean but i'm over it basically i'm not over over it the nightmares are still there the flashbacks are still there mm -hmm. it's something that i'll never get over you know i've been diagnosed with ptsd at a severe level my score was 84 when i went in by the time i'd finished therapy it dropped down to 13 so the therapy worked and mm -hmm. part of that therapy was kevin yes yeah, so. i mean what was it like saying sorry to will after you realized what you'd done what you'd put him through destroyed his life because even though you've done a life sentence you've gave will a life sentence also yeah i had no problem in apologizing to him I couldn't wait to get it out of my mouth to, to, so, so he could understand that I genuinely meant it, James. Um, it weren't just voice, it weren't just words. Um, and I believe that Will felt that in me, seeing me say, I'm, I'm so sorry for what I've done to you. Um, I'm no A-list actor, and um, which is why I, I do so well on the TV bits and pieces that I do because I'm just myself and... and being yourself is transparent, and I think Will thought felt I was transparent. He'd being truthful to him, um, so I'm sorry it's, to him was a bit of I suppose. I had twenty years to think about some things. And at the time, I used to still think I felt I was justified to it, but then I thought <sighs> I didn't know what I'd done to him in terms of ruining his life. So when I felt I ruined his life, God. Just, I didn't feel like I wanted to crawl into a hole. I felt like I wanted him to see the the sorrow in me in terms of I generally felt, my God, I want to put my arms around him. So come here, listen, that ain't going to happen to you again. Not why I'm on this planet. Uh, yeah, just, uh, it's so difficult to sort of explain what I felt. But I was sitting there just numb. Just absolutely numb in terms of I couldn't think about anything else, but I was tuned into his words as as if as if 
I'd been hypnotised. I was in my mind wasn't flitting off here and there. I was just sitting there, just listening to everything he said. Everything, and it was just going in there, and um, and and then for some time after, I didn't sleep that night. I had a very late night's sleep, laying in the bed, staring at the ceiling, thinking about it. You can't, you, you, you can't, well, I just can't walk away from something like that when you've met someone, seeing what you've done to him in the manner that he was when I met him. It was, um, it was difficult. And I don't give two fucks about if I've hurt someone if they deserve it. I don't, I'm sorry to say, I don't. Am I a, a psychopath? No, I'm not a psychopath, but I can commit acts of, on people um, and feel nothing about it if I think they've done something terrible. Well, I used to anyway. Uh, not, I haven't done that for many years, but uh, I, hadn't, I don't think about a lot of the things I've done to people because I just don't care if they've deserved it. But I think about him all the time and one other person. What would you say to Will now after realising everything that you've put him through? Obviously words. Is it going to rectify everything that you've been through your life? Is it going to change much? Possibly not. Will it give you closer closure? Of course. Can you kick on and create a better life for yourself again? Definitely. But what would you say to Will after everything you've put him through and coming face to face and having the balls to sit and meet you and, and kind of putting things right? Even yeah. though he had every, every chance never to see your face again. One brave dude, one brave person sitting there. And you know what, Will, you know, for all of this, we're now friends, aren't we? As yeah. crazy as it is. And yes. it, it, it's amazing now after what I've done to him. And you can get on with anybody if they're good. They've got goodness in their heart. So as rough a character as I am, uh, I don't see myself that, by the way. I don't see that people see me as you see me. But I, I do believe now people do see me like that because you people say it and I feel fucking oh, really but <laughs> but Will sees the goodness in me as do multiple other people that I meet uh, whether it's in the petrol station around the corner and the machines are broken the young black lad behind the counter they said I'll get you some milk mate out the back don't worry about that and uh, just chatting away to him and then after chatting away to him he goes I know you didn't I I said you might have seen me and he said bloody hell but from my interactions when I went into the shop doesn't show uh, ultimate violence towards that person. They say, oh, he's a bit of a character. He carries himself well, but he's really friendly and really nice. I say that, obviously, anybody could say that, but I just, I know that's how people receive me across the board. So, Will sees me like that, irrespective of what I did to him. And I said to him today, should we go and get something to eat after? Do you want to go and have a pint? Yeah, he's going to have a pint. We're gonna go and have a few points, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do it a bit now. If you go missing later, well, man, I know. If I go missing now, he's been doing jiu jitsu for ten years. It'll have been wrapped up. Come on, Samurai. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what would you say to Kev? Obviously, being sitting here today and uh, try to put things right and show people how it should be done. This is the way men should handle things. <laughs> admitting their faults, admitting their guilt, and it can't be easy for Kev. So I've got nothing but respect for him to be here and actually take it on the chin to admit what he's actually went through but for you and just sitting here and going through it all again I know it'll bring back a lot of emotion but what would you say to Kev? Uh, well I'll thank him for his time uh, and basically not for what and the, the for coming through for me you know with my closure because he could have turned around and said no I don't want to meet you but I feel that I benefited from meeting him with regards and that I, I you know, I've, I've I've said to Kevin that I just want to become friends. I want to put what behind us and let's just move forward. You know what I mean? That we, when we meet, we don't talk about the kidnapping. We talk about other things, don't we? Yeah, yeah. to have a laugh. Yeah, we have a laugh and joke. And, or general general life stuff. Yeah, My yeah. personal life you know is we, life. Yeah, that's that's past. You know what I mean? We both know it was wrong. You know what I mean? At the end of the day. I've never discussed it, have we, Will? No, never. We've never discussed it. I've only just realised that. Only when you've told me things about... Yeah, yeah. ...the actual, like, the fella uh, and the woman and that, you know, and what the old Bill done to you, but never what I actually done to him, as we've discussed here. That's very... I've only never thought about that yeah. until no, now. Yeah, Why do you think that is? Does that shame, embarrassment? No, I don't, because we get in the car and we start chatting away. Yeah, I don't think it's something we... We've had our... 
We've had our restorative justice minute. We've said what we wanted to say, and as far as I was concerned, I drew a line in the sand that day, and I don't want to go beyond that line, sort of backwards from that line. Mm -hmm. I just want to keep moving forward for good things, like doing things like this, getting the word out about restorative justice, how it can ha how it can help mm -hmm. victims, not just victims, but perpetrators as well. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because there will be people out there probably watching this in a couple of weeks' time, two, three months, maybe years' time, thinking... I need to do this. I need to. I need to contact restorative justice. You know, what I mean, it could be. Uh, it yeah. could swing both ways. That changes the game. I Imagine think. an old man or an old lady, or just a young man or a young girl, and think about what them, per, per, what their someone's actions might have done. Mm. If you look at what it did to you, in in, in varying degrees. <sighs> just imagine that we're really, mm. for what people have got no idea about what their actions may have done yeah. and would you like that done to your sister your mother your brother your granddad your auntie your cousin whoever and uh, we can't justify our actions we can't deflect it and blame other people which is what i'm trying to seem to do today but i'm guilty of my actions that's a fact um and that changed his life dramatically so get your asses up to a start of justice if you can it may just do you the world of good as well yeah where do you guys go for the forward for the future where does kevin will go what's the plans the ambassador the restorative justice yeah well yeah um i mean they've got talks with uh the why me um charity in london restorative justice um looking at the ambassador side of things but as as i mentioned i said it's not just a case of me it's like my kevin follows me with my story it's not just me telling my story i, I want kevin to stand next to me mm -hmm. with my story uh, and I feel just getting the word out to because when you look when you look at all recently all the knife crimes oh we're talking about that weren't yeah, we today all the knife crimes all these you know kids it's in prison now yeah. for a silly act of Mad. it's just kids craziness they're still be in prison now for killing yourself yeah, yeah exactly yeah for wrong information yeah this, exactly. I, I believe this will be on this is like a TED talk as well I believe you two should be on stage talking about the misery of the torment you've caused Kev but then the misery and torment that you've had to go through and then coming back to it and then sorting your differences and apologetic and showing okay listen I've messed up only thing I can do is apologise but that's unbelievable like today is, un is one of the best conversations See, that you, I've had you can't, you can't turn the clock back and withdraw the actions but in my eyes like I, I wanted that I wanted to I wanted to I wanted him to I wanted to hear him say sorry and once I heard that, and when you used the remorse, he's had remorse, uh, that was enough for me. That was like every every tick in my box from therapy was done that day. And it is such a, it is, I can't stress how much relief it is to actually go through this process and see the outcome. It might not benefit everybody, depending on what the crime was, uh, either innocent or guilty. But I do, ben I do feel there is a benefit of actually sitting in front of the person who hurt you. I feel the same. Well, I mean, you might have to have uh, a, an offender sitting there against a the victim, and they might not like the victim still. Mm. Okay, but there's, if they've got something inside them, yeah. they can be heavily entrenched in their views and still say, well, they still, they, she still deserved it, or whatever, they deserved it, whatever. I don't give a monkey's about the rest of it, but... If they're that cold and callous, and then they need help. Hmm. But I think there have been pretty much 90% of the crim criminals or people who have offenders who have committed a crime uh, do have compassion and do have love in their heart. Yeah, and exactly. I think that there's going to be something through that meeting that will touch base with them. And I think it can own, and it is powerful, Will, isn't it? I, I just, you know, do you know if we were having this interview, but just me and you and I'd, I would be sat here in tears because I could, I, could, I could never talk about what happened to me without emotionally filling up and bursting into tears and like, if there's certain things that I talk about the suicide I do get emo I, when I attempted to take my life I do get emotional over that because it was one of the stupidest things that I'd ever ever gone through my little head that that night I don't know why I was thinking why I've done that but Someone said, to, the, the, someone said to me, but well, you woke up, you're still here. And I do believe there's a reason, you know, I mean, why, you know, I mean, why I survived that night, 
why I survived the attempted suicide. You know, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, this could be the reason in getting the word out. You can change leaves. Yeah, it's called change leaves. So, in terms of what we do discuss, um, did I discuss you? Did we have a laugh about the old style committal with my best mate coming in dressed in different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, fancy dress. So, this is something. So, the only conversation we've had about it is I said to him, he said, Oh, how's, your, how's uh, Marcus? My, my, my best mate, Marcus. He says, He's right. Don't have his photograph taken. He said, don't you mention my name and all the rest of it, right? So I do. <laughs> <laughs> right? And uh, he asked how Marcus would have thought, well, Marcus would die if he knew, he knew your name. But of course he knows his name. So he had the trans, he had the, the statement and all the rest of it when he's been arrested, Marcus and the mayor, blah, blah, blah. So my best mate, he come to court, he got bail because of the, the witness descriptions and it didn't match him too much. He got bail after four months, right? I said, you're leaving me, right? So he's gone home. He's walked through the court the first day. He says, no. And we laughed about this, didn't we, Will? So we're, this is the point we're making. We're laughing about something that happened in the trial. The door's opened in the magistrate's court. He's come through in a black and white stripy top, white trousers like a burglar, right? I've looked at him. He's got his hair just pissing. And I'm trying not to laugh. because like, he don't dress like that. The next day, he's coming like Mr. T. He'd been around my mate Blossom's house who had a couple of safes. I used to keep some money in Blossom's house years ago before I got my own safes. He had rings on every finger, chains, all chains round here, bracelets, a lot. Just like Mr. T. The third day, he came in, dressed a bit, all his hair brushed a different way, like a casual. He got a not guilty because he didn't, he didn't match the descriptions. And the judge <laughs> thanked him for keeping us entertained with his dress sense. <laughs> so we can't say that Mr. Lemaire matches the descriptions. I thought you couldn't say he matches anyone's descriptions right now. But we laughed about that, didn't we? Yeah. And... Uh, because, I mean, everyone was laughing when he came in the court thing. What's he going to come in like tomorrow? But he got him bleeding, you know, got him not guilty. And he's quite rightly so, because he weren't there when I did it. Mm -hmm. However, we laugh about that type of stuff, don't we? And that's yeah. the only conversation we have had in terms of the trial process and what he went through. Uh, in terms of what the police put him through. How he turned up drunk and they put... I thought we had a missed trial. No, but we got, he got put off, didn't it? Got put off, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tony Judas just reminded me yeah. about that. That was me. I... I stopped to process for two days that's how long it took me to get in the dock two days and i was forcibly i was under police guard that day like no drink no drugs well mm. i did take drugs because they couldn't stop me from doing that so how are you feeling after today i feel great i feel you know i was as i said at the start of the interview like anxious nervous i feel more relaxed now it's not as bad as what i thought it was going to be <laughs> no of course you're in good hands it's more yeah. relaxed yeah than, it's obviously as I says and done. People say it's okay, this and that. But obviously yeah. you've you've came here, you've done what you've had to do, and I believe this will open doors for anybody watching. Well, that's maybe went through a life of trauma and pain and never think they can get out. What advice would you have for them? I'd say get in touch with uh, why the Why Me charities, the restorative justice charities, or if you if you haven't got one local to you, then victim support contact them. Start the process. Start the conversation. It is a long process. But at the end of the day, I would suggest it because it's done me wonders. There's probably people sat at home now, uh, right at this moment in time, who's had something really bad done to them and they've just bottled it up and bottled yeah. it up and still bottling it up uh, to get out of there and contact, the, mm -hmm. you know, the Why Me charities or the vic victim support and yeah. the help. It's been life changing support. for you, was yeah. it? Oh, moving forward. It was, you know, like after, I was, I, and it's weird, I say to people, like, you know, why did you meet him? What, what's all that? They don't understand. It's like if you wake up with a hangover or a headache, what do you do? You take a paracetamol mm -hmm. to get rid of the pain. That's, that's my pain gone. I'm just sitting here in front of Kevin in the car with him, having coffee with him, you know what I mean? Is my therapy, is, is my drug, is my yeah. is my pain relief. How are you feeling after today, Kev? Uh, I, listen, I love, I love seeing Will because it's nice for me to see him and see him laughing and joking and taking the piss out of me. To be fair, he does, don't worry about that. Yeah. And, uh, it's nice because we just... Especially driving. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's nice to be able to think, God, to think all these years later, it's amazing how things can turn out. Yeah. Amazing. And... Uh, uh, yeah, it's not, it's, it's it's nice. It's just it's uh, peaceful. Yeah, yeah, bloody hell! I mean, God, doesn't this show people what can happen, what you can do? Um, 
And it'd be really worth people reaching out and making the first steps for themselves because they are bottled up like Will says, and that's not good. So I've seen the changes in Will, his appearance, getting rid of the beard, cheeky little bastard. Yeah. <laughs> but that's good. He's already got the, his humour back. Yeah. I'm a cheeky little bastard. But it's nice to see someone have that character of strength to start being themselves and get rid of that baggage they've been carrying around or park a car park car up in a car park and leave it there mm -hmm. and get out and walk and he's now walking a, a, a better life so i thoroughly recommend yeah. it do you think this is a clean slate for you to then kick on and have a positive life well it is yeah I, I, i've i'm actually moving i'm trying to rebuild my life uh it's it's not uh it's i've, got, I've lost 30 years but i'm trying to what what time i've got left i want to enjoy it and the only way i couldn't enjoy it three four years ago Amazing, that isn't it? Because mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, I just had this fear that he was going to come and get me. But to stop that, restorative justice, I'm now moving on my life and I'm loving life. And yeah, amazing. It's uh, totally different. But it's, I'm going to try and rebuild my relationship with my daughter, me, me um, sisters, and family. In that, you know, it's going to take time. I hope they understand that with watching this as well that they'll they'll see a different. You know, I mean, why I've been elusive why i don't speak to them why i don't text them why i don't contact them you know might help them understand a little yeah, yeah. and that's, that's what the these thing. things are for is to get well, an yeah, understanding yeah. of the whole situation the way kev's life went the way your life went nobody wins i mean i i wrote about the kidnapping in my book but when i wrote the book i wrote it in 2004 i wrote it about it as, as if he deserved it hmm. so i've got a new book coming out and um I'm writing it at the moment, and part of that will be Will in there about the transformation of what I did to such. It'd be about my life coming home, meeting Will, the problems I've had with uh, people when I've been released from prison, girlfriends abusing my position as a convicted contract killer and using the police heavily against me, claiming all sorts of madness. But yeah, and other people. I'm going to lambast, but I'm, so I'm going to proper give it to people in my next, but Will, I'm going to set it out for the better and Will can have a piece in that. I'm going to ask him to write, he didn't know this by the way, I'm going to ask him to write a little piece about something. So, um, moving forward, it's been a big positive in my life really has mm -hmm. and uh yeah i'm lucky to have him as a friend let's have it right he could have told me to fuck my off so i'm the i consider myself very lucky uh in terms of and, and not say fortunate but uh respectfully that the man's seen he's got compassion in his heart to forgive me for what i did to him well norwegians are very good at it look at all the students who got killed and uh, it'd be something, it's not just about forgiving the people of what they've done to you, which is, he's shown that as well. So people should reflect on that. Yeah. Listen, lads, for coming on today and sitting face to face with each other. It's been unbelievable. A great conversation. I believe this will change lives and other people can maybe sort out their differences over 10, 20, 50 years ago, whatever it is. You two have came at the forefront. You've been men about it, very brave about it, including yourself, Will. But would you like to finish up on anything else, lads? Yeah. We do, we all have listen. Pleasure. Well, well, hugs. Cheers, mate. Would you like to finish up on anything else? Um, again, just uh, get involved. If you're feeling down, lonely, unsure what to do, contact by me or victim support and start the process. I did. Look at me. Well done, lads. Listen, nothing but the love and support for the future. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Cheers, Cheers. James. Thank you.